Okay. Oh, it's on now. Hello. Um, my name is Hannes, and today I want to talk to you about um, Aka.net. Um, so what's going to be on the agenda for today? Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history, where it comes from, and, and how we came to the point where we are today. And then I'm going to give you a brief introduction um, about how Aka.net works and what goes on behind the scenes. Then I then I'm going to explain you what problem we tried to solve with it. Um, and then I'm going to explain how Aka.net fit into all that. And then we'll dive into some of the implementation details and some of the stuff that we ran into. And then I'll try to wrap it up and send you off with some resources that you can use to go beyond what we're going to talk to today, because there's going to be so much more. Now, to dive into a bit of history, um, we're going to have to think about why we even have ACA.net. And the first idea is about building software in a way that resembles physics and that resembles the real world, world date from the 1970s, just like a lot of things that we're using today. Um, is it because people back then were less distracted by their smartphone or did they have better drugs? I don't know, but a lot of the stuff was invented around those times. And those ideas, they were refined throughout the 70s into the early 80s, but they didn't have all these multiprocessor machines that we have now um, to actually bring everything into practice. And the first moment where they actually made an attempt to bring everything into, into practice was uh, Ericsson. And Ericsson was a telco, uh, a, a, a company that made hardware for telcos. And the way that these telcos made money is you pay for your phone connection, then you, then you pay per second that the connection lasts. So downtime costs measurable money. And what they were after is like, we want to minimize our downtime. And they had all these ideas in the actor model that they thought, thought that, like, okay, we can use this. We can use an actor system to actually achieve what we're after. But they didn't have a program la programming language to do so. So they invented their own. They made Erlang. Um, Erlang is a language that has an actor model built into it. And they used that to build a huge code base that ran these uh, multi-node telco systems that allowed them to get up to nine nines of uptime. And to put that into perspective, nine nines of uptime is about 31 milliseconds of downtime a year. Who runs a system that has an uptime like that? Yeah, none of us, really. Yeah. So that existed since the 80s. But then on the .NET ecosystem, the year that we got all the actor systems that we have to today was 2015. It's incidentally the first year that I came to NDC Oslo. And it's also the year that I decided that I wanted to be a speaker. But that is the year that we got all these actor systems. Microsoft in February released Orleans which was the actor system that they used to build the backend for Halo 4. And the way that you make money on a video game is you get good reviews in the first couple of weeks and then your sales will peak. So if your backend isn't able to handle the load, you're going to get bad reviews and your game will flop. So that was kind of like a big deal and they were really successful in doing so. And then just two months later, uh, the first production stable version of Aka.net came out. In the same month, Microsoft came up with Service Fabric Reliable Actors. And if something like this happens, um, it makes me wonder, it's like, why 2015? Because we had these ideas since the 70s, we've had the first implementations since the 80s. On the JVM, it had been happening a few years earlier, but why now? And it's basically because the free lunch was over. Before that, we were building software and we could scale in a classical way. We would add a couple of nodes to our web farm, maybe add some read nodes to our database cluster. If that didn't hold up, you added some kind of caching. But that went on pretty well because all these processor, man processor manufacturers were putting out faster processors every year. And most of the applications that were written were inside companies where the user base didn't grow as much. But then we got the internet and smartphones and internet of things and that scaling scenario didn't hold up anymore and that's, that left a lot of people looking for other solutions. That why we got, that's why we got all these actor models. Now, 
the thing is that free lunch was over because of this graph. This is about 40 years of data about process, the processor market. And you can see a couple of trend lines that are really not giving us hope. Like the clock frequency has stabilized for more than a decade. We've had three gigahertz processors that we could overclock to about five gigahertz on um, liquid nitrogen since early 2000s. Um, but also the single thread performance is tapering off. There's only one line on this graph that's giving us a little bit of hope, and that's the number of cores. When I started out as a programmer, it was, it was very normal to have a desktop with a single core. Now you all have eight in your pocket, right? So that's the number that we want to take advantage of. That's the one that we want to use to be able to scale really well. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to do threading inside an application. Did it make you happy? Not that much, right? Because threading, especially multi-threading, is hard. Because at some point, you're going to end up inevitably with a little bit of shared state. And you'll get race conditions on that shared state, so you'll try to solve them by blocking them. You lock the resource, and then you have the potential to actually cause deadlocks between threads. And I mean, it's, it's all misery and downhill from there. And you'll end up, inevitably, with a little bit of serialized code. Code that can always only run on one thread. And there's a smart guy called Amdal who spoke about that. It's like, how much can you speed up a workload by throwing more resources at it in function of how much of the code you can actually parallelize? And on this graph, you can see even the green line, that is like 95% of the code can be parallelized. It doesn't matter how many CPUs you throw, up, uh, throw at it, you'll never end up with something that is more than 20 times faster, because you'll have that 5% that needs to run in series. So we're going to need to get to a much higher number than 95% if we actually want to be able to scale across many, many, many cores. And that's where the actor model comes in. It promises us a couple of things. It promises us an extremely high degree of parallelism for stateful systems, because parallelizing something that is stateless, that's really easy. That's basically a web server serving files. You can parallelize that to infinity and put a load balancer in front of it. But as soon as you're dealing with state, it becomes hard. And that's where we get the reactive patterns that will make up uh, what is the actor model. So that's the history. Um, let's dive into how that actually works, because there's a couple of building blocks that we need to familiarize ourselves to. And the simplest building block inside an actor model is an actor. And an actor is basically an instance of a class that holds its own state and its own logic. And it the only way to talk to this actor is actually to send it a message and that message get dis gets dispatched to this actor. On a single thread, one by one, in order, right? And that's important, because inside the scope of your actor, you don't need to worry about locking. You don't need to worry about multi-threading, because you can always assume that the code that's executing inside your actor is gonna be the only thread that is dealing with this state. So you can just write very easy, clean code. And that is the power when you're dealing with this. Th this makes it easier from a de developer perspective. And the simplest thing you can do is something that uh, looks like this. This is probably the simplest actor you can write. You'll inherit from untyped actor. And an untyped actor um, has an unreceived method that you need to implement. And all the messages get dispatched to that one, uh, one by one. Of course, if you use the untyped actor, you'll need to figure out what type of messages you're getting, and then you'll be able to deal with these messages. Now, speaking about messages, also your messages, they're very, very simple objects, but you best design them to be immutable. The fun thing there is ACA.NET doesn't really enforce them to be. If the message doesn't cross a machine boundary, the object reference just remains in the process and it gets passed along. So theoretically, it would be possible to change a message that is being processed by another actor. Just don't do that and make your own life miserable. Um, because as soon as it crosses a machine boundary, it gets serialized and deserialized and, and you use that behavior that you're trying to exploit. 
Now, the people from ACA, from Petabridge, they're claiming that we can get um, up to 50 million messages on a single server. I can consistent, consistently get over 2 million on my laptop, so it's probably ballpark correct. Um, now, immutable messages, now in .NET we have record types, which makes it a lot easier to do immutable uh, classes. If you're not using those features, you might want to design your classes like this. Uh, make sure that your properties only have getters, set them in the constructors, and think about using immutable collections. Because it's still possible to change the contents of a collection after it has been instantiated. So with the immutable collections, you can actually solve that. So we've got our actors, we've got our messages, and then we need to tie all that together, right? And for that, we have an actor system. And an actor system is basically the, the glue to, to make everything happen. It manages the actor lifecycle. It instantiates your object instances, your actor instances. It will also kill them for you. It will handle all their inboxes, and it will dispatch their messages to, um, to these individual actors. It will also take care of all the thread scheduling for you, and that's nice because we already established that we don't want to do that ourselves. There's also a publish subscribe uh, system in there where you can do uh, pub sub messaging between actors. We're not going to cover that in this talk today, but it is there. It's basically your puppet master. It's the puppet master that controls the whole system. This is the Metallica album that I first listened to when I was young. It's still the best one out there. Fight me on that. Um, now, how do you create an actor system? Um, it's not really harder than calling actor system.create, and that will create an actor system inside the process that you're running in at that moment. Doesn't do much, but it's an actor system. And then when we, when we want to create our first actor, the first thing we're gonna have to do is to create props. Because I told you, we are not creating our own actors. The actor system is going to do that for us. So what props are, are basically a pointer to a constructor. You can pass constructor parameters using the, pro uh, the create props methods, and that will actually point to a certain constructor on a certain object that will get instantiated as an actor. And when you tell the system to create the actor for you by calling the system.actor off, um, method and you're giving your actor a name, what you'll get, ba get back is an actor reference. And an actor reference is not a reference to the actual object. It's a small object that you can use to communicate with the actor. You can use it to send messages to the actor. You can use it to do um, other stuff. You can even do like um, a synchronous call where you wait for a response. But the simplest thing is to just tell a message and that sends it to the inbox of the actor and it will get processed. Now, these actor references are really awesome because they um, you can pass them around in your software and you can use them anywhere to talk to that actor even if you don't have any references to the original actor system. So that's a pretty powerful thing. I'll show you later what they can do on top of that. But if we could only make a few actors um, inside our actor system, that would really not help us with scaling that much. What we'll need to do is design our hierarchy in a proper way. And actors have this hierarchy. There's the three top level ones that we get for free, the three blue ones. And under the user actor, that's where the ones that you will create actually go. So if you call the system.actor off, that will be the top level ones. The, the A1 and the A2, that, those are the top level actors that are the ones that you do, uh, that you create by calling actor off on the system. And your address in the hierarchy define, is defined by your position in it. And this is important because that allows you to address certain actors directly. And this hierarchy is not just important by managing and keeping everything separated, it's also important for supervision. Are there any parents in the room? It's like, yeah, quite a few. I have three, so um, I don't know why I did that. Um, but if you take your kids to the supermarket, what happens? If they knock something over, if they misbehave, who's responsible? You, right? Exactly. And that's how it works with actors as well. If your children misbehave, you are responsible. 
Which means, in more concrete terms, if an actor throws an uncaught exception, the exception is escalated to the parent, and the parent will then need a supervision strategy to deal with this exception. So you can expect which kind of exception you're getting, um, and you can define a certain behavior. And you can apply that behavior to all of your children or just the one that failed. Sometimes you're splitting up a huge workload into multiple chunks and you're delegating them to different actors. If the whole workload is invalidated by uh, a single child failing, that's the moment that you will take action on all your children except, um, except for on, um, instead of just on a failing one. And you can, you can basically take three kinds of actions. You can um, tell your kids, like, they will look at you and they knock something over and they look at you as like, and you'll be, nah, it's fine. Continue. Like the message that you just got, you can discard it. I mean, that error is not that bad. We can continue, take the next message of the inbox and start processing that. But if your child is like severely misbehaving, you're going to tell it to stop. It's like, stop whatever you're doing right now. In the actor system, that would mean that you would actually kill that child. Don't do that with your children. Um, but basically what you'll do is you'll, you'll uh, eliminate the actor instance and you'll throw away the entire inbox and that actor is done at that moment. Or you can restart. And restart is the default behavior. Restart is basically what you'll do is you'll kill off the instance recreate it with the same props, which is basically you'll call the same constructor with the same constructor parameters and create the new actor. Um, and once it has been instantiated, it starts, it starts with the same message over again. It will retry the same message on the new actor instance. So the inbox gets preserved by the actor system. And that's why it's the default behavior. Now, all of these you'll have to figure out for yourself which you're going to need in your case, but you have a lot of options there, and it's a really powerful mechanism. And this is what helps you create these resilient systems. Now, there's a couple of development ideas that you're going to have to do differently uh, when you're doing actors instead of uh, simple object orient uh, orientation. And there are so many that we can dive into, but the general uh, idea is that you're going to take every workload and cut it into really small pieces, and then cut that into even smaller pieces, and you're going to delegate all of those into separate actors. And that's the way that you manage your scaling. And you can instantiate separate actors for every task. And what you want to do is you want to push all the risk to the bottom of that tree that I showed you earlier. Because if those actors fail, their parents can recover. They can use their supervision strategy to recover from any failures. And one thing you have to watch out for, and we learned that the hard way, is it is possible to get an over overflowing inbox on an actor if you have an actor that handles, has to handle too many messages. Um, and this is caused by the single threadedness of an actor. There's always only a single thread, so you're always limited by how many messages you can process on a single core on that single actor. Um, but it's easy to design around that, like talk to the child actors directly instead of talking through parents, and that will solve a lot of it. There's also a whole bunch of design patterns. patterns. Um, a lot of them are documented in the Petabridge uh, blog. And they also have a course that you can take online. Petabridge is the company that maintains Aka.net. And you can get training from them by the people who actually built the framework, which is really nice. There's one that I didn't want to withhold from you because it really resonates with geeks. Um, any Star, Tr Star Trek people in the room? Yeah? OK, what happens if they have a guest actor? What happens with the guest actor? Yeah. So they arrive at a new planet. You, you have these guest actors that, that do like one or two shows, right? And they arrive at a new planet. And who do they send down? The guest actor. And that guy dies. <laughs> but that's OK, because, because that guy dies, the main cast can survive the entire series, right? Um, and this is what you're going to be doing if you're designing for resiliency. When you are going to do anything risky, you're actually going to make a child actor for it, and you're, delegate, you're going to delegate that risky operation to your child. And because of supervision, you can deal with the outcome of this risky operation. 
What is risky? Anything that goes over the network, anything that goes to disk, basically anything that leaves your process is potentially a risky operation. Even if you're talking to another node in your actor system, that is potentially a risky operation. But this makes sure that your main cast, your main actor survives, um, and that you can preserve the state that is important to you. That card is annoying. Um, you can preserve the state that you really care about and not risk it by doing something that potentially blows up your actor. I feel like we're deep enough into how this whole thing is pieced together to explain to you what we were trying to solve when we were um, dealing with this. Um, these will probably look familiar. This, this is what they look like in my house, but they're probably very similar in Norway. It's my electricity, gas, and water meter. And the company that I was working for at the time was providing an IoT solution. We had um, a gateway, an IoT device that we could put in the customer's house, and that would connect to these meters. We could connect to the new and fancy digital ones that had serial ports. We, could also, we, we also had ones with optical sensors that, could, uh, sensors that could actually read the spinning dials. Um, and that data was sent to our backend, and we wanted to process that at a very large scale. And on, based on that backend, we would offer insights to our users, um, dashboards, alerts, all that sort of stuff. Now, to simplify the problem for today, um, what we're going to look at is what we want to achieve with these meters is we want to store that data so that we can monitor it over a longer period of time and that our consumer can actually get the graphs that they want to have. And we want to be able to compare time periods. It's like I installed light, uh, LED light bulbs in my house. How is that affecting my usage? That, that should be something that we will be able to do. And then we want to put on some alerts, like momentary or periodic threshold alerts. First thing you need to understand there is meter readings versus, versus consumption. These meters, they show a number, right? And that number doesn't really mean anything to you as the consumer. It's usually the number of the amount of consumption that was measured by this meter since it was produced at the factory. Usually, that correlates with the amount of um, consumption that was measured since it had been installed in your house. But even that's not true, because these companies, they reuse meters. Or you bought the house from somebody else, and the meter was already there. What you care about is how much this number changes, because that's what you're going to get a bill for. And if this number changes, then we're talking about consumption. We're not talking about the meter reading, right? And that's the first cal calculation that we're going to have to do on this. Um, it's very simple. It's subtracting two numbers. I think you can all figure that out. And thresholds and alerts are really not that hard to grasp either. If I give you a threshold, like when is my consumption over 90? OK, that happened at 10.30. Now, if I'll tell you, it's like, OK, what happens if my consumption is over 90 uh, for more, uh, over a certain number for 20 minutes? The red line is pr pretty clear. We've been over that for 20 minutes. But the green line could be a discussion point that you have with your product owner, because we have dipped under it for one of the buckets, but on average, we've still been above it. So that's. Um, we had different rules for that between different types of devices, which was fun. Now, where did Aka.net fit into the solution that we had? If you ask Microsoft which stack you would need to build a typical IoT solution, this is probably like a picture that they would paint for you and they would promote all their uh, Azure services. You'll get similar ones on AWS, so, so don't worry if you're on the Amazon side. Now, the left, the left side is everything you'll need to communicate to your device. Now, we built this way, way before IoT Hub existed, so we ended up doing a lot of that ourselves. Presence detection, sending events from the device to the backend, sending control from the backend to the device, authenticating devices, all of that. Now, that's a solved problem. I wouldn't recommend building that over again. Just use IoT Hub. It's good. Um, then you're going to need to process that data somehow. You're going to want to capture it all, dump it into storage somehow, probably enrich it, um, all that sort of stuff. And they'll give you things like fun functions and stream analytics and event hub and, and that sort of stuff. 
but you still haven't provided any business value. The value comes from sending alerts to your users, giving them dashboards, all that sort of stuff. And that's the stuff that's going to be on the right. Now, Aka.net can help with um, a lot of this. It can help with all the shaping and enriching um, and even with the storing of the data. It's not going to be the storage technology itself, but it can help doing so. And it can also be very, very beneficial in generating alerts because when you're generating alerts, usually you're looking at longer time windows. And we set out first, before we did this, we set out uh, in doing it with stream analytics. But stream analytics wasn't really good at that time to take uh, changing configuration data to change the window sizes of the windows that you're looking at, which kind of threw it out um, as a use case for us. And ACA.net is really, it's really easy to keep a, a little bit of data in memory and then evaluate whether you have passed a certain threshold or not and generate an alert condition based on that. So very simply put, our backend looked like this. Um, the user got a web portal that talked to our ACA.net cluster. And the cluster was actually responsible for fetching the data from storage. And the ingestion happened through um, IoT Hub. After we built this, we switched to IoT Hub. Um, IoT Hub was ingested by a, an app service. If you've never worked with Event Hub or IoT Hub, it's a little bit like Kafka. It's a stream where you have a pointer where you are with your reads, right? Um, and to delegate all those messages into our Akka.net cluster, we used an app service. Why? Because we could pause that. And that meant that the ingestion part of the whole solution stopped for a little bit so we could do stuff on the cluster like a redeploy, something like that. Now, one of my pet peeves is developers using stuff that it wasn't meant for. And you all live in Europe, or most of you, sorry, not you, Michael. <laughs> um, but the myth around all of Europe is that the magpie, this black and white bird, it's the bird that is attracted attracted to shiny things, right? And so are we developers. We are attracted to shiny things that we want to use in our code base. So what would Aka.net, in my opinion, be a good fit for? It is anything that manages a stateful application and that you want to really generate high throughput on. Um, that would be a really good fit. If you want to get close to real-time gaming backend, that would re be really good uh, with an actor model. Um, stock trading systems, uh, IoT solutions, um, even yeah, any any system that that needs to be scaled out across multiple machines and that benefits from threading and using state. Now, I think you all get what we wanted to build. I want to show you some of the parts that we um, maybe struggled with um, and how we solved some of it and. I think that's probably valuable. Um, so think about the problem domain that we had. Um, we're going to dive into four, four topics, and that should bring us pretty much to the end of the slot. So the first thing that you're going to deal with, not just in an IoT solution, uh, but it was very painful for us, is normalizing data. Making sure that you have consistent data to work with is a, it's not a complex task, but it can save you a lot of pain. Some of the devices that we were dealing with, they were these microprocessors. And I, I know that when I speak to object-oriented developers or whatever, like microprocessors, they think about something like a, a Raspberry Pi, right? Get like two gigs of RAM, something like that. These were devices that had eight kilobytes of RAM. Eight kilobytes of RAM is just about enough to construct an HTTP request and send it to a dedicated SOC that would actually do the Wi-Fi stuff and, and send that out. So the, the biggest problem with these microprocessors is that they didn't have real-time clocks. They would have a guesstimation on how long had passed since the last time you asked for the timestamp, but a minute was never really a minute. So you would get something called clock drift. So when you, if you send out your message now exactly on the minute mark in 15 minutes, it will be like one or two seconds past the minute, and, and that drifts through time. Also, people are stupid, so they turn off their internet, they unplug cables, power goes out. I mean, you're going to get gaps in your data. There's going to be data that's missing. 
And then the fun thing is, when I explained to you earlier that we had these optical sensors and we had the ones that talked to the serial ports, most of you probably thought that those serial ports would be the easy ones to deal with, right? But they were serial ports without error correction. So every once in a while you would get a flipped bit. And if that flipped bit was in your meter reading, you would get like a huge spike and a huge dip and then your graph would continue as normal. So we wanted to filter that out as well. And keeping into account that all of these things might happen throughout your entire code base, that's just way too much work. We had logic dealing with a lot of these problems in a lot of different places. And when we, um, at one point, we decided to centralize it and do it in one place, and that made things so much easier. So if you get this clock drifted data on the left, um, you see that at this point, the clock has drifted for about 25 seconds past the minute mark. And we're getting these meter readings, right? And we only care about, the, we only get the meter readings. So we can extrapolate the consumption from that, but we only get the meter readings. But what we actually want is data like this. We decided for our applications that five minute buckets were fine, but a lot of the devices would report, report more frequently. So we would, interpolate the data, these are simple uh, interpolation um, calculations. We would interpolate it uh, exactly on the five minute mark. And we would calculate the consumption from, um, from the meter readings. So we would actually go from stuff like this to stuff on the right and hopefully end up with like an extrapolated meter reading on the five minute mark. And then there was gap filling. Gap filling sounds easy, right? We miss a couple of the blue dots. So let's do something to the orange bars at the bottom so that we can continue because we want all of our downstream actors to be dealing with a consistent stream where they get messages that are five minutes apart. Now the question is, how do we fill that? And does the downstream, do the downstream actors need to know about the fact that it has been gap filled? Because sometimes you don't you might not want to trigger certain alert conditions um, when the data has been gap filled because it's never going to be correct. And the ones that you can all come up with really easily is we cannot fill it at all or put it in as like one big, big, big spike at the end or at the beginning or in the middle. Or we can just divide it amongst the three buckets and get a flat line. Or we can look at the bucket before it and the bucket after it and then plot a trend line between the two. Well, all of this will look pretty okay if you're missing three quarters. It's going to look like shit when you miss two days. And I can tell you, more people than you would imagine have devices going offline for extended periods of time. So the solution that we ended up implementing was something that looked at the same time period the week before and then scaled all the sizes of the buckets to make sure that the total sum matched up with the sum that we knew that we were missing. In that way, we knew that the total sum at the end would end up and that it would match the bill that they were getting from their electricity company, so everybody was happy. It looked a lot more correct. It still wasn't. So take it all with a grain of salt. Um, that was actually one of the harder problems that we had to solve uh, mathematically. Now, how do you do that? If you have a device actor that takes in the data from the event stream, what we're getting in is the raw meter readings. The numbers that are shown on the meters, that is the stuff that we're getting in and that we have to deal with. So we spun up a child actor that was actually responsible for, um, was responsible for, for converting that into consistent data. Um, it would keep into memory the last messages it got, so it didn't have to go to disk or anything. It just got work out of memory and spawn like the normalized meter readings and send them back up to the device actor. And from then, uh, from then on, that one could distribute it to all the downstream actors that needed to do anything with this data. Now, this is also a, des a design pattern that you'll see a lot and that you'll want to use a lot because it makes, makes refactoring actor systems a lot easier. Um, it's called the parent proxy pattern, where actors will talk to each other through a common parent. So you'll go up the tree until you hit the common parent and then escalate down again. 
Um, this makes sure that if you refactor some of the actors and the way that the hierarchy sits, it doesn't affect anybody else. Um, it doesn't affect anybody else, and you don't need to refactor all the other branches be below the common parent as well. Um, so normalizing this data um, made it so that in all of the other actors, we could just assume that we got five-minute data, and that made stuff so much easier. Now, you see we, we had this, gra this, this drawing about the actors uh, sitting in our actor system, and we have messages coming from... Um, from the IoT Hub. At some point, you're going to have to try and get those, those messages to your central actor system, and you're going to need to be able to dispatch them to the device actor that I just showed you. And the package that you can use for that is aka.remote. And the way this works is a little bit um, tricky. Actor systems, you cannot really as, uh, address another actor system from the outside. You can address actors. I showed you that earlier. You have your actor reference, and you can do a tell, and that will get dispatched to the inbox of that actor. But you cannot really address a remote actor system unless you do it from another actor system. So actor systems can talk to each other, but you cannot talk to an actor that lives on the other side of the wire unless you have its actor reference. And this uh, remote addressing is a very important part. You can remotely address an actor if you know its location. And the location is a protocol that you're going to use to talk to the other actor system that lives on the other side of the wire. You're going to need that actor system's name. You're going to need the port and the IP address that it lives on. And then you're going to need to know the location in the um, actor tree to actually talk to it. Now, this address is encapsulated inside an actor reference. And what is really, really cool is that you have something called location transparency. And location transparency is pretty fucking cool. If you serialize that I actor reference and you pass it on to another actor system that lives somewhere else in your cluster or somewhere else in another actor system that is acting as a client, that actor reference will still work. You can still use that to send a message to an actor that lives somewhere else. You don't even have to know what the reference to the actual actor system is. You can talk to that actor using the actor reference. And that's what you need to end up using when you do things um, like this. So what we had is we had a simple client actor system on the left. And the left side system here is the app service that I showed you, the one that was wedged between the IoT hub and our real cluster. And inside that app service, we spun up um, a separate actor system that was responsible just for talking uh, to and relaying the messages to the device actors that lived on the other side. Now, that client actor system um, is just something that we instantiated in process, just like I showed you earlier. So what we did is if we got a message for a device that we didn't have a proxy for yet, is we used the system.actorof to create a top-level actor in that actor system, and that is the proxy that we were going to use to talk to the device actor that lived on the other side inside the bigger cluster. And as soon as that actor spun up, it would actually talk to the device manager on the other side. That is an actor that was managing all the device actors inside the cluster. And what that one did is check, like, okay, do I already know about this device? If yes, it would just pass back the actor reference to that device. If not, it would instantiate that actor and then send back the I actor ref to our proxy. And from then on, our proxy could actually use that actor reference to talk directly to the device actor. And this is also how we solved the bottleneck issue. That device manager might be a bottleneck if you try to send all your messages through that one. So don't do that. If you talk to individual device actors uh, directly, um, you avoid that you have this bottleneck. Now I want to show you a little bit how that works in code. Uh, we have something really cool that's called free start. Free start is a method that you can use to do stuff in your actor before it starts accepting its first messages. 
So everything that you do in pre-start is called after the constructor has been called, then pre-start is called, and only then do we start dispatching messages to this actor. And that one makes the connection to the other side. And for that, here, we use something called an actor selection. And an actor selection is a lot slower than an actor reference. But it's, it allows you to talk to actors based on their address. So what we used is we, we knew that the device manager was on the other side, and it was user slash devices. So we used that to make um, an actor selection so that we could actually send our connect request to the other side, to the other actor system. And that would basically send a message back. And if that message came back, we would actually keep the reference, the I actor reference um, from the other side. So we get a device connected back. And from then on, we can actually use that to talk to the device actor. Now, you might have noticed that we're not doing untyped actors anymore. We're doing typed actors. The receive actors is the strongly typed version of the untyped actor that I uh, showed you earlier. Now, what's cool about the receive actor is you can register handlers for certain types of messages. And that will feel a lot more comfortable for most of you is if you're coming from a normal C-sharp C background. And what you do with this receive is you're registering a handler. So if you call receive again at some point, you can actually switch the behavior of your actor when a certain type of message comes in because it just replaces the handler for that message from then on. And this is also a pattern. Um, I'm not going to dive too deeply into that, but that's something that's also really important. You want actors to have switchable behaviors. For instance, until we receive our device connected back from the other side, we might want to stash all the messages that we got from the stream. And then as soon as we become connected, we replace the handler on that message. We replay all the messages that we stashed and then start handling the rest that comes in. It's a pattern that's uh, not that hard to implement. Uh, there, there are methods to do so um, inside ICA.net. It's the become and the unbecome messages, um, methods that you can use to do such things. And we just use the iActorRef that we got back to talk to the actor um, on the other side. And this is a tip that I'm going to give to all of you if you dive into this. Um, as I explained earlier, props are a pointer to a certain constructor. And you have a params array of objects that you can pass along to that function to give the right constructor parameters to your actor when it gets instantiated. But you can already feel that a params array is not really the way that you want to deal with it, because if you want to refactor something, you might have runtime errors, because there's no uh, compile time checks that you're actually using the correct number of arguments of the correct type. So what I usually do is I make a static method on every actor where the parameters of that method map to the parameters that we see in the constructor, which is at the top of this file. And then we do the props.create inside that function. Now, if I refactor this one, my code base breaks in all the places that I have used this actor, and I can really, really, really easily deal with it. So that's a tip that you get from me. Um, in that device manager, um, on the other side, we're just going to do very simple things. And what is important here um, are things we can just check if we already have a child that has this ID. And then what we need is unique names. I told you that the address is defined by your place in the hierarchy. If you would spin up 25 actors called device below the device manager, they would all have the same address. Aka.net will make them unique for you, um, but they will not have a controllable name. So usually what you do is you'll put an ID or a GUID in there so that you know which actor is which. And then you'll use context.actorof, and this is how you spin up a child. If you use context, it means it, it is the message processing context, context of your actor at that time. And you can use that to instantiate a child. And all you'll have to do is reply to the sender. And there are a couple of properties that are really relevant there. And sender is the sender of the message that you're handling at that moment. 
And the actor system does this for you. It sets this property before it dispatches the thread to process the message. So sender is a, is a message, that, that, and a property that is always set. And that's also very valuable. Because there is a way to actually forward messages. You can use tell. And I'm going to come back to tell in a second. You can use tell to send a message to, um, to another actor. You can always u also use forward. And forward is basically we're going to preserve the sender of this message that we're processing right now. And we're going to send the message along. So when you're doing these proxy patterns, what you can do is you can reply to the original sender. Without knowing where that actor lives, you can just, if you use forward and sender in the correct way, you can basically get those patterns to work really easily for you. And in Akka.net, you have two ways of interacting with an actor. You can do tell, which is basically, I'm going to put a message in your inbox, um, and you're going to be able to process it. Uh, process it. You can also do ask. And ask is basically, I'm going to put a message in your inbox, but I'm going to wait for you to do a reply to sender so that I get a response from that actor. <coughs> and there is a saying in the, in the US military, they have ask, don't tell. But when you're building actor models, they have tell, don't ask. Basically, what you'll want to do is you'll, you'll try to avoid ask as much as you can. When do you use ask? You use ask when you want to get some data out of your, um, out of your actor system. For instance, on an, on an edge of the system and you want to get something for an API response, that's an acceptable place to use ask. Like inside your actor system, try and avoid it at all costs because it only causes problems. Now we've been talking about actors for 45 minutes now. And I've been always talking about them as if they just had all of their state in memory. And you've all felt the elephant in the room, right? If I recycle my process, what happens to my data? And with what I told you until now, your data will be gone. Luckily, we have a solution for that. Because there's always a couple of actors that you really going to want to reinstate with the correct state after your system reboots. And we've got a persistence library for that. Um, underlying, it can use a lot of different things. It can use uh, SQL Server or Azure, t Azure Tables or a lot of different things. Um, and what you'll need to do is you'll need to create a persistent actor. And a persistent actor is an actor that will allow you to preserve its state and to recreate that state after it has been, um, after it has been recreated. Now, there's a couple of ideas, you need to give it a unique persistence ID. ID. It is event sourced, so what you will do is you will persist the messages that mutate your state. And at some points, you can also save a snapshot so that you don't have to replay all eternity when you recreate an actor. That's like a, a boot performance optimization that you might want to do. So how do you do that? We have a couple of uh, classes that you can inherit from, and they will all have persistent actor in their name. This is the receive persistent actor. First thing you do is you give it a unique persistent ID. You can do that with the device GUID um, in the constructor. And what I always do when I write persistent actors is I'll group all the state into a state object. It makes snapshotting a lot easier. It also makes reasoning about what is actually muting, mutating my state also a lot easier. Um, so that's why I usually group that into one of those. And then instead of receive, we now have two methods. We have command and recover. When an, in, uh, a persistent actor is created, it will actually query the underlying snapshot store and event store. It will reinstate the snapshot, it will replay all of the um, events, and only then it will start accepting new messages from the inbox. And command is a message that comes from the inbox. It's something that comes in from the outside. Recover is a message that comes in from the persistence layer when the actor is recreated. And you're going to want to deal with these a little bit differently. You can also um, register for the recover snapshot event, which is basically what happens when the snapshot is fetched from the storage 
technology that you're using and to reinstate the, the actor's state. You can also uh, deal with the, because saving a snapshot is something that happens out of, out of thread. So when you trigger a safe snapshot, your thread will continue and it will be put on a queue for snapso snapshots to, to save to disk. If it's important to you to know if this operation failed or succeeded, you can register for the snapshot success and snapshot failure, um, which will be sent back to the, uh, the actor that tried to save the snapshot. Usually you don't care that much. You'll snapshot every once in a while and missing one is not that big of a deal. Um, when a command comes in, a command that is going to mutate your state, you're going to want to persist that to your storage technology. And that command um, gets persisted in the event table. And you're going to want to pair that with actually mutating your state. So you have this persist method that takes in your command message, and that'll get persisted. It will also dispatch that to the method that actually mutates the state, uh, the state, which is my handle message internal. And incidentally, that's the one that I'm going to want to call on a recover, because that will do all the state mutations. Um, and snapshots are better done in the, um, in the command part. You don't want to trigger new snapshots while you're recovering. I mean, that's, that's a loop and a rabbit hole that you don't want to go into. Um, and I told you that a state object makes it a lot easier to reason about this. If you have methods like this, like state.add, and that adds your message to the state object, and that mutates all the fields inside it, it makes life a lot easier. Now, um, when you get a snapshot back from disk, it's really easy. You take the snapshot object from your snapshot offer, you cast it to whatever type you expect it to be, and then you just replace your state object. It makes life so much easier. And you can register these. I didn't do anything with it in the example, but th those are the ones that are going to trigger if your saving of a snapshot failed. Now, how did we do that in our device actor when normalized meter readings came in on the device actor? You know where these came for, uh, from. It's the, norm the normalization actor that I uh, talked about a couple of examples ago. That normalized meter reading comes on the, uh, in on the device actor, and we actually spawn a child which will deal with persistent, persistence. And we had a value storage actor, and that's an actor that was actually using the ACA.NET. Um, persistence mechanism. But that one only held the working set of data. The working set of meter readings and, and, and consumptions that we actually cared about for the operation of the system. The window that you needed to trigger your alerts or the window that the us user would usually query, like one day, maybe two days worth of data. All of the rest got relayed to a second actor that lived as a child of the storage actor, and that one would actually persist to cold storage, being, in our case, just a simple SQL database. But that's the data that only got queried occasionally and that we didn't need to get back when the system rebooted. It was fine living on cold storage until somebody queried it. But the hot set of data, that's what we wanted to recover when the system rebooted, because that, that's what we would generate our alerts against and so on. And when we did that, because I already explained how that all worked, when we did all that, um, it became important to think about what happens if you recycle your cluster. Because there's a couple of things that you want to do. You recreate, recreate all your actors, that's not that hard to do. Um, but you want to minimize how many of your persistent actors actually hit your, um, your persistence infrastructure. Because if you just build all of the actors as persistent actors, yes, you will get all your state back, but it's also going to be hell to reinstate your cluster. So what we did is we made actually one value storage actor that persisted for every device. And all of the other ones, the ones that needed state to operate, for instance, the value normalization actor that we talked about earlier, that one needs the previous message, but it's not going to persist that. It, upon startup, it will use its pre-start to request it from the value storage actor that we now just created, and that will actually 
make sure that that one can do its operation. And also there we use those switchable behaviors to stash stuff in the meanwhile. Same thing for alert actors. Those also needed a working set. They would also query on startup the value storage actor. They would not persist their own state. And that's how we got these system recycles up to an acceptable speed. And we made sure that we could actually reinstate the system after a redeploy really easily. Yeah, I already talked about all of this. Uh, we've got like five minutes left. So we've gotten to the point where I want to be. That's good. Um, there's so much stuff that I didn't talk about today. Um, first of all, I talked about a lot of concepts today, but this is nowhere near what you need to run this in production. Um, we didn't really talk about configuration. Um, configuring an actor system uses a language called Hokon. Uh, it's the human optimized configuration object notation. Always have to think about that one for a second. It's something that comes from JVM Aka. Um, that they ported to .NET. It looks a bit like, like JSON, but it's not valid JSON, so there, there's that. Um, you'll need to set up your cluster. We didn't really talk about what goes into that. You'll, when you're doing clustering, you're going to have to think mainly about how am I sharding my top-level actors or like my just below top-level actors, because that's going to be the tricky part. If you have a correct sharding mechanism, to divide your actors uh, across all your cluster nodes, you can basically scale to infinity. But that's the stuff that goes into that and your clustering setup. If you spawn children, they live on the same node unless you tell them otherwise. So that's the easy part. For us, it meant distributing the device actors across the nodes, and that made sure that we could scale out the cluster. You're going to want to lock things. Um, there's adapters for all the popular .NET logging frameworks, so that's not really that um, tricky. There is dependency injection. Uh, the reason I mention it is because that's like a huge anti-pattern. If you feel the need to inject a complete object graph into every actor, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, so you'll need to think about redesigning that. But there is support for uh, DI containers. And if you want to monitor your system in production, like monitor inbox sizes, queue times, how many actors you have on each node, uh, all that sort of stuff, there is uh, Phobos, which is basically the only paid ACA.NET component. It is built by Petabridge. Licensing is affordable. It's probably uh, around $4,000 for a company-wide license a year. If you're doing something of this scale, that should not be an issue for you. But it allows you also to plug into um, some of the popular dashboarding systems and, uh, and logging systems. So that's really powerful. So if you're triggered after this and you want to start learning, there is an awesome boot camp on GitHub that familiar familiarizes you with a lot of the basic concepts of Icon.net. Um, you can go and follow that. Um, you can do that on your own. There's some stuff on, on, on sites like YouTube and Plural Sites. The Petabridge block is a gold mine. I mean, I really love all the people at Petabridge who are building this because they really light, uh, write um, very thoughtful blog posts, posts about all the new features they release, about all the stuff that they run into. So if you dig in there, you're probably going to find the info that you want. Um, you can get remote training from them. That is paid, but it's really good, and you get it from the people who actually built this stuff. So that is... Um, a huge plus. And then there's one thing that is was the most worrisome for us. It's deployment. I mean, redeploying your cluster is something that you're going to do on new features quite a lot. But it's also a scary part. Because at some point, you're going to need to take down the cluster and, and spin it back up. And that's the moment that you'll lose all your inboxes, right? Um, so what we did is we paused the app service that I talked about in the beginning. Um, I'm getting into, ooh, the timer gets red when you go into the last minute, so we're almost there. You pause that so that you don't get any, any incoming messages on the cluster. Um, you wait for the processing of all your inboxes to end, so that's something that you will, will want to monitor. And that's the moment that you can actually redeploy, reboot, let persistence do its work. Um, you will recreate your actors, and then you can resume sending from the event stream. And if you do this right, you're not going to miss a beat. But you'll have to automate this, right? 
Um, if you do this by hand, it'll go wrong eventually, and then you're in a huge shitstorm. Ask me how I know. So my conclusion, um, check if you have a problem that is actually fit for actor models. Um, decide which part of your solution you're going to use Akka.net for. Design your actor hierarchies appropriately so that you don't get bottleneck actors and so, so that you can easily chart the important parts across your cluster. Normalizing data is something that is going to help you a lot, not just in an actor system, but in any message-driven data stream. And you're going to have to think about what happens when you recycle stuff, because that's one of the harder problems. My name is Hannes. I'm the head of learning and development at a company in Belgium called Access. This is my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. I'm trying to make ICQ great again. You'll find a whole repository with all the code samples and more that I use today. So if you check out that repo, a lot of the concepts are going to be in there, and you can explore that on your own. I'm already over time. It says time up here. So what I suggest is if you have questions, I'm going to make room for the next speaker, but hit me up in the hallway, and um, you can ask me anything. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>